In general, most Canadians eat sufficient protein to stave off the potential effects of protein malnutrition or protein deficiency. However, there are certain places in Canada and there are certain places in more developing countries where protein deficiency is very common. And protein deficiency typically leads to one of these two outcomes both of which have potential very negative effects on the growth and development of the person experiencing it. So marasmus is a wasting syndrome, and this occurs when a person doesn't consume enough food in general. They don't consume enough energy at in total and they don't consume enough protein so when this occurs when both energy and protein are deficient they are at higher risk for just looking very very thin um, and their body kind of wasting away and eating at their own body proteins and this increases the risk for anemia it can cause certain heart problems it can also negatively affect body temperature regulation which has its own set of potential negative outcomes so this is marasmus is quite serious and typically needs to be addressed at an early age in order to minimize the negative effects that it could potentially have you may have also noticed on some of the commercials where they're talking about like feeding, feeding needing children in other areas, you often see children that are very, very thin, but have like a bloated belly. And I remember as a kid being like, I don't understand, how can they be so thin, but have this bloated belly? This is typically due to a condition called kwashiorkor. And kwashiorkor is protein deficiency when energy is adequate. How could this happen? This can happen in areas where like there's one particular food that everyone eats. So let's say rice or maize or corn, and they just eat that one type of, of grain typically. And remember that these plant products are incomplete proteins, so they would be lacking in at least one of the amino acids, leading to protein malnutrition. So like I mentioned, that distended belly is usually evidence that kwashiorkor is occurring. And quite honestly, we don't totally understand why that swollen belly occurs. There is some, some lipid deposition in the abdomen and there might be some swelling that's associated with edema, which we know can happen with protein deficiency. But the overall cause of it, of the distended belly, is still something that's being explored. Nonetheless, it's really important to reverse both of these conditions to minimize the damage that they they can cause um, you'll often hear people talk about high protein diets as a way to moderate body weight and again as I say in every unit we have to remember that the only thing that can change our fat mass is if we are at an energy surplus or an energy deficit an energy deficit consuming less calories than you burn this is going to lead to a reduction in fat mass and weight typically calorie surplus where we eat more calories in the burn that leads to a gain in fat mass and a gain in weight as well so high protein diets that promote an energy surplus are going to actually cause you to gain weight okay so it doesn't matter about the nutrient it matters the total amount of total energy yielding nutrients in the diet however high protein diets are often recommended for weight management because protein tends to be more satiating, more filling than the other nutrients. Okay, and this is well established. We're more likely to be hungrier if we're eating really like sugary carbohydrates or like processed food that's really high in, in more simple nutrients. Um, proteins also are important for carbohydrate and lipid metabolism as well. So that might be one of the reasons they can potentially improve body weight. Plus, we actually use more energy to process protein compared to the other um, nutrients. So there's a little more cal caloric burn with eating proteins compared to the others. Okay, so in general, it does make actual sense to consume a higher protein diet if you're trying to manage your weight. For instance, for me, my weight is the number one thing that I struggle with nutritionally. And protein is such an important part of my diet really to promote fullness because I have a condition called the eat forevers where I can eat forever. <laughs> and if I don't consume enough of these filling types of foods, protein rich foods being one of them, I can very easily eat too much. So that's one of the reasons high protein is something that I include in my own diet. You've probably heard that protein is important for muscle growth. And indeed, we see that 
protein muscle synthesis does increase when con individuals consume more protein followed a workout. They recommend about 10 grams of essential amino acids in the first two hours following like muscle building exercise, like resistance training, like these push-ups that these individuals are doing. And actually milk protein seems to increase uh, muscle protein synthesis quite well. And that's also recommended often for building muscles. Okay. In general, athletes have a higher need for protein because they're constantly building up more body proteins, plus they're damaging their muscle proteins when they're exercising. But really, beyond two grams per kilogram body weight per day, we're getting into an area where you're getting way more protein than you actually need. And often that leads people to just wasting their money <laughs> on extra protein supplements. Most of us don't need beyond about 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight a day, even if we are active. So protein is really important for our bones. Remember that one of the main things our bones are made of is the protein collagen that minerals like calcium can harden. However, high protein diets promote calcium loss. So you would think if a high protein diet promotes calcium loss, that would be negative for our bone health. However, overall, the research shows that high protein diets do not seem to negatively affect bone health. And that might be because of their ability to build up the collagen needed for that bone matrix. When people consume a high protein diet, they're going to be using more protein for energy. And remember, to use amino acids for energy, I got to clip off that nitrogen-containing amine group, which means that my kidneys have to work harder to excrete that nitrogen-containing amine group out through the urine. In general, if people have good kidney health, they don't really have to worry about potential harm caused to the kidney by consuming too much protein. However, people with impaired kidney function, we recommend that they moderate their, their protein intake so the kidneys don't have to work any harder. So the recommendation for people with um, reduced kidney function is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight, which is actually the recommendation anyway. The thing is people in Canada tend to eat a lot more protein than they need. So getting it back to recommendations, that's what we recommend for people with, with compromised kidney health.